Two prominent cardinals are having a very public discussion about what constitutes Catholic teaching as we await a verdict on the Vatican trial of Theodore McCarrick and the Vatican summit on sex abuse. Papal Posse member Robert Royal rides in with analysis. And we'll get story ended with best selling children's author N.D. Wilson. He'll interview me about the new Will Wilder book, The Amulet of Power. And finally, he's an award winning actor, director, philanthropist, and author of the new memoir, Grateful American. Gary Sinise is here to tell us about how he found his calling serving our nation's military men and women. The world over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States on the World Over, an important World Over for you tonight. Robert Royal, N.D. Wilson, and Gary Sinise are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's program, you can tweet me at Raymond Arroyo. I'll be live tweeting throughout the show. Here's some news from the World Over. On Wednesday, the Vatican announced the upcoming canonization of Blessed Cardinal John Henry Newman. The papal decree comes after the Vatican last year judged the healing of a woman to be miraculous. The woman, whose name has not yet been made public, was inspired to pray for the intercession of the cardinal after reportedly watching a film about him on EWTN. The founder of the Oratory of St. Philip Neri in England, Cardinal Newman, was one of the most prominent converts to the Catholic Church from Anglicanism in the 19th century. He was a renowned preacher and teacher, theologian. The date of the canonization of John Henry Newman has yet to be announced. Pope Francis on Thursday nominated a new Camerlengo, Irish-American Cardinal Kevin Joseph Farrell, the prefect of the Dicastery for Laity, Family, and Life. He is also a former Auxiliary Bishop of Washington. Farrell's responsibility as Chamberlain of the Holy See will include overseeing the preparations for a papal conclave and managing the administration of the Holy See during the interregnum. That's when the Pope dies. Farrell, you may recall, had no recollection of knowledge of Theodore McCarrick's misdeeds despite living with the disgraced former cardinal for about six years. Here to help us unpack this and much more, I'm joined by the editor-in-chief of the CatholicThing.org and one-third of the papal posse, Robert Royal. Bob, thanks for being here. Um, you are going to be in Rome for this big uh, confab. It was billed as a summit on sex abuse. It doesn't quite look like that's what it's going to be. It, it, it appears, and again, the, 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 the organizers of this, from Cardinal Supich to the Jesuit, they're all over the place. Of the intentions and the shape of this event. What are we looking at here? Well, I, I don't know either. I mean, we, one of the reasons I'm going over there is I'm going to try to keep my ear to the ground and mm -hmm. then write some daily yeah. comments. I don't even know if we can call them reports because we don't know what kind of media engagement there is going to be. Yeah. I mean, let's go back and remember that our bishops in November wanted to take some concrete steps about, at least in this country, what to do about the abuse crisis, and oh, they were correct. told not to because we wanted a uniform yeah. approach for the church as a whole, globally. Right. And th we were told that this February meeting was when it's going to happen. Now it seems that it's going to be more testimony of victims right. and experts about, you know, what, uh, what abuse actually is. We keep hearing that other parts of the world don't even, aren't even aware yet of, how to, of the problem or how to deal with it. So I don't know. I've predicted that there are only two certain things. One is it's going to be polarized. It's going to be, be politicized in the way everything else is yep. these days. And the other is that nothing certain will come out of it. And my hope, I mean, I think this is the most we can really hope for, is that at least individual bishops' conferences will be free enough to go on then and do something. I know that a number of the higher-ups in our American mm -hmm. hierarchy have plans of things that they want to do, and let's hope that when it's all over they can do that. Well, some of the organizers are saying the bishops already know what they have to do. This is to remind them of the, the mechanisms that are in place. But why do they need to be sensitized to a problem that they're all dealing with. We know there's abuse of minors, but in this case, it's and certainly in the United States context and in India in recent days, it's adults, it's nuns, it's seminarians, it's bishops abusing their authority. And the fact that that's not on the table, bishops abusing authority, and who are these victims? Why the preponderance of male victims? It seems, it's bizarre to me that none of that's being 
explored. And we're just going to have a parade of victims kind of talking about their experience. God bless them, but they could do that in the home diocese. And there doesn't seem to be a fine point at the end of this. Now they're saying it's media engagement. They're here to engage the media. What? Yeah. I think you know, we Americans in particular are frustrated because uh, we've had the Dallas Charter since 2002. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we, we've cleaned up a lot of the problem with priests. So we, we have reporting. And the protection of minors. Right, and the protection of minors. For us, the next step now is the one that's the most important, and that is holding people accountable, trying to understand why things happen the way that they did in the past so that they will not happen in the future, mm -hmm. that either bishops themselves, as in the case of McCarrick, abusing right. people or covering up in, in ways for friends or, or others that they're sympathetic Speaking with. Speaking of Cardinal McCarrick, his, um, he was the mentor of Cardinal Kevin Farrell, who is now head of the family sacred dicastery in Rome. Farrell was appointed this week as the Camerlengo. Now, the Camerlengo, very important job when we have an interregnum, when the Pope dies. Tell us what the Camerlengo does and the import or implication of Kevin Farrell being appointed to that role. Yeah. In one way, this is very surprising, and in another way, it's not surprising at all. Uh, it's not surprising because Francis promotes the people that, that are close to his vision of what the church ought to be, and Farrell certainly somehow manages to fall in that category. The, the surprising side of this is, is that he lived here in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. for six years in the same residence with Cardinal McCarrick. And it was right. McCarrick who brought him in and made him a bishop and, and mm -hmm. basically had him run the diocese while McCarrick was, was tra traveling quite a bit. So um, if you wanted to look at the optics of this, now, to me, I, I believe Cardinal Farrell had to know something. He denied it when the story came out. He actually did a video for the Catholic News Service mm -hmm. that was so mm -hmm. awful that some people called it a, a sort of the Manchurian candidate video. He wouldn't, he wouldn't really talk about anything. Yeah. So there's something fishy there. I wouldn't want to condemn him without actual evidence, just as I myself wouldn't want to be mm -hmm. condemned without actual evidence. But the, the optics of this just look terrible. I mean, we know that th there's a possibility that, that former Cardinal McCarrick will be laicized. He will no longer be a priest. And at the same time, the Holy Father has appointed a man to this sensitive position. He is the one who certifies that the Pope is dead when he dies. Mm -hmm. He's in, he has to be there in the room. In the room. And they do certain they things. They, the tap, they break the yeah. ring. They tap his forehead and all mm -hmm. that. And then he manages the church in the interregnum, which means right. the, between the rule of one Pope and the, and the next Pope. Now, he has limited powers. It's, it's just sort of a caretaker position. But if you had to speculate, I think that people want the the uh, Francis regime to kind of stay steady until the next person is elected. So mm -hmm. that seems to be the explanation, but it's a very uh, unusual choice to put a man like that in such a visible position when he seems to have at least mm -hmm. some compromising uh, positions with regard to McCarrick. Wow, and days before we are told Cardinal McCarrick could be laicized mm -hmm. for his actions not only in Newark but in Washington where payouts were made during this period. It's just... It's mind-boggling, yeah. the optics of this, when you're having a summit to clean up sexual abuse and you're promoting people who were certainly party to it if not, if, if they didn't have full knowledge. Look, they were uh, present There are all sorts of cardinals time. who live and work in, in Rome, and you could certainly have found somebody who would have been a fairly neutral oh, yeah. figure who, would, who could have carried out those duties in a fairly neutral way that wouldn't have raised suspicion. It's odd that it's an American, yeah. an Irish American. Yeah, that's in quite the, unusual. Role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk for a moment about Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, the former CDF head, the head of the, the Vatican's uh, doctrinal office. He published a manifesto this past week. Now, he says it came from the request of many Catholics asking for a clarification of teachings. Um, I want to read a little bit of this to you, Bob, and to the audience, and then get your reaction to why now. He writes, Many wonder today what purpose the church still has in its existence when even bishops prefer to be politicians rather than to proclaim the gospel as teachers of the faith. The Christian goes through a narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way that leads to, the ruin, is to, to ruin is wide, and many are upon it. To keep silent about these and other truths of the faith and to teach people accordingly is the greatest deception against which the catechism vigorously warns. It represents the last trial of the church and leads man to a religious delusion, the price of their apostasy. It is the fraud of Antichrist. What do you make of that statement? 
Well, he says that not only lay people, but bishops and other cardinals asked him to do this. So this is, as we know, ever since the Dubio were published years ago, the, the cardinals who presented their five, uh, I actually have them here, but I won't read them out yeah, yeah. to our, our viewers. But we should remind people, this came out of Amoris Laetitia, right. which was... It was uh, it, look, it raised questions about can communion, the primary question always was, can communion be given to people who are divorced and remarried without an annulment, mm -hmm. which, which has traditionally been regarded as adultery, and how can someone receive communion who's, right, who's in, in that an state. adulterous situation? Mm -hmm. He also mentions in, in, uh, intercommunion because there's been this ambiguity in the Vatican about spouses, especially in Germany, spouses of Catholics or themselves not Catholic. But he affir what I think that what he affirms is what every pope in recent times has affirmed until we got to the, the dubia. Mm -hmm. These questions that still hang out there that seem to contradict the tradition, certain things that the, the Holy Father has tried to, to do by way of mercy and accompaniment and mm -hmm. discernment. We don't have any clarity about this. And I, I think he affirms, he says that the basic truths of the faith are no longer known by a number of people. And the people who do know them feel very nervous about the tendencies that we see. So I think he's laid out there a, a very strong statement that certain things cannot be changed because they are part of our tradition. That no one person can change the, the revelation, the truths about God and about uh, faith and morals that belong to the Catholic so faith. what is he talking about here when he says it represents the last trial of the church and leads men to religious delusion, the price of their apostasy, it is the fraud of Antichrist. Is he saying that we're, we're in the midst of a delusion that's part of the Antichrist? Yes. I, I, I think he's... He's at least hinting in several places, and we had the, the instance when the Holy Father went to the, uh, the Emirates uh, mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, yes. where he signed an agreement with a Muslim imam of saying, you know, that God has willed a plurality, a plurality of religions and that th this is like uh, race, color, nationality. Um, God has willed this. Now, some s clever theologians have tried to say, well, you could make the case that in God's permissive will, yeah. Just as he allows us to be sinners and to mm -hmm. he allows evils in the world, you could make that case. But I'm a little skeptical of this because several people have pointed out quite astutely, I think, that there's a difference between saying that God has willed a plurality of religions. That is not really a Catholic position, it seems mm -hmm. to me. And I don't know why the Holy Father signed off on that. He could have said, you know, we're, we're all trying to live together. We believe in God as our common father, mm -hmm. and there, therefore we should seek to live in peace and harmony yeah. and advance one another. Instead, what he did is he connected this with things that have nothing to do with faith and morals. My, whether I'm white or red or green or black, I mean, it make, that's not a, a question of morality or of choice. That's, no. that's just what nature has, has produced me to be. Right. This is a very worrisome development, and I think he is worried that there's a kind of an indifferentism, that truth itself, the, the kind of truths that Catholics have always thought define our faith, mm -hmm. those are being abandoned, and maybe that is the, the type of antichrist uh, element that he's fearing. Well, Mueller claims these are part of the corporal works of mercy, to point out these errors and what the church teaches. Cardinal Walter Casper responded to this manifesto this week in pretty stark terms. I mean, he's claiming that though it contains many statements of faith that every upright Catholic can wholly, wholeheartedly affirm, some of the truths are pointed out, quote, so pointedly that it fades out the other half. He suggests that Mueller is following in the path and footsteps of Martin Luther. Well, I, I think this is quite hilarious because, <laughs> you know, Mueller is with I did too. <laughs> Knowing them both, I do too. Yeah. Mueller, I mean, Mueller has sat right where I'm sitting and, and basically refuted the, the kinds of things that Martin Luther was talking about. Right. Look, there are truths in the faith. You could almost say that Martin Luther, with his emphasis on, on grace alone or scripture alone, that's a dividing point. It's a truth that divides Lutheranism from Catholicism. Mm -hmm. So for Casper to come out and talk about Mueller being the, the one who's divisive here, I find this quite hilarious because it's it's Casper who actually actually proposed that that innovation, uh, that innovation <laughs> of accompaniment of, of people who are divorced and remarried. Um, I don't find a single word in what Mueller said to be anything other than what has classically been understood to be Christianity. So I think Mueller either ought to specify what you know, where the division is here. Sure, there could be division, but there could be division over what's true and what's not. True. Well, as you said earlier, I think what we're seeing is the, the tribalism in the church where it's becoming Team Francis and Team Benedict. Yeah, and, and, and people are sort of taking those sides. That's a bad place. Very bad. We, we need to have a common understanding and, and Catholicism bridges those gaps. It's not divided, and it shouldn't be. And it's bad, I think, 
for cardinals and bishops to play into that. Mueller is not doing that. Mueller did not, is not denouncing anybody particularly. But you have Cardinal Casper coming out and calling out another cardinal, suggesting he's Martin Luther, when one could make the objective case, Cardinal Casper looks better suited for that role. Right. I mean, anyway, let's talk about this book in our final minute. There is a uh, publication hitting any day right before the summit. It is a book that is supposed to out a large number of priests, cardinals, and bishops at the Vatican who are um, homosexual and engage and live the lifestyle uh, out of step with their public pronouncements. Your take on what we might be in store for and why now? Why the publication yeah. coming? Well, it's clear that for PR purposes, the writer and, and the publisher have decided, I, I think it's going to come out next Wednesday when I will be in Rome and I'll mm -hmm. take a look at a copy then. And obviously they want to ride the wave of the world's attention on mm -hmm. the, that summit meeting. That said, I've seen a number of the excerpts quoted in French. Mm -hmm. I'm a little skeptical of the numbers. He says that 80 percent of the people who work in the Vatican at high levels either are homosexually attracted but not necessarily acting on it or are active homosexuals and therefore hypocrites in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And he himself, his name is Frederick Martel, is seeking through these interviews that he did. And he had a lot of access to people in the Vatican. He says, in fact, that the uh, that uh, Battista Rica, who runs Casa Santa Marta for mm -hmm. the Holy Father, was the one who facilitated his his uh, mm. his access who to people his in own the Vatican. Who has his own history. history. Yeah. It, it was about Battista Rica that the Holy Father said, "Who am I to judge?" Right. Way back when in that, right. that plane ride. But look, even if the numbers are wrong, even if the eighty percent sounds high to me and it probably sounds high to you, and we've been following these yeah. things over the years, even if it's forty percent. That's quite a bit. And, mm -hmm. and if, if, therefore, there is a kind of a gentleman's understanding off the record that uh, because I am myself homosexually attracted, I look the other way with you, and we, we all seek to live together and just let this thing lie somewhere. If that is true, mm -hmm. and we're going to have to look very carefully at what that book says, if that part of it is true, it's a very disturbing uh, thing. But who is it designed to hurt? Obviously, it's, it's dropping for a political reason. Yeah. What is it? Well, Martel himself is a gay activist. He is a gay man uh -huh. and a gay activist. So the, his, his effort here is aimed at making the church more gay friendly. Mm -hmm. And he quotes a number of people saying uh, that the Holy Father has made appointments that are more gay friendly, that he's promoted Father James Martin, et cetera. All of that, I think, is public knowledge, and it's, it's quite true. But the question is, is outing or, or raising the, the, the consciousness of how, how large a problem this is in the Vatican itself, will that make the church more, more gay-friendly or will it make it more controversial? Mm -hmm. Because we know that there is a, a homosexual element that is played into the abuse crisis, mm -hmm. which no one wants to talk about mm -hmm. other than persons like ourselves these mm -hmm. days. So I, I, don't, I don't know what the, the effect of the book will be, but I know what its aim is. Its aim yeah. is to make the church more... Uh, openly friendly to, mm -hmm. to homosexuality. Robert Royal, we will be following your missives and or reports yes. from Rome in the week ahead. You can follow all of Robert Royal's reportage and commentary at thecatholicthing.org. And now it's time for a very special story-ended segment. We're talking today about Will Wilder III, The Amulet of Power. It's my latest book in the Will Wilder series coming out from Random House Crown on February 19th. Now, I'm going to do something I rarely do on the show. I'm handing the microphone off to the esteemed middle grade author. He's done much more than that. He's also a filmmaker, N.D. Wilson, who agreed to interview me about this third Will Wilder book. Here's a bit of our conversation. Watch. Will Wilder. Yes. And the Amulet of Power. Mm. So this new book focuses on strength. It does. Strength as a theme. Yeah. And if stories are soul food, as I would say that they are, yeah. what are you trying to give your readers? Like, what kind of edification do you want them to take from this well, adventure? You know this. You start to tell a story, and this one I started two books ago, and then the story reveals itself as you're writing it. That's, at least that's right. what happened here. I knew the rel I mean, I spent a lot of time figuring out, okay, what's going to be the primary relic, the secondary relic, uh, you know, and, and the, 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 the demon in each book. All of that I, I take a lot of time figuring out. Yeah. I do a lot of heavy research, as you know, and that's all the boring part. But 
Fun for us. Boring Fun for, for us. Else. Boring for everybody else, including you people watching. But <laughs> the amulet of power was is the locks of Samson, which even as a kid, I always thought, if there's one thing every boy wants, it's super strength, super power, right? Yeah. And here I have wispy, poor little Will Wilder, who can't make it onto the middle grade <laughs> football team at Perilous Falls. Perilous Falls Middle. He's trying. He wants to be in the football team so badly, and he snatches the amulet. He claims not not to want to use it for football, but he really ends up using it to get on the football team. And he likes the adulation. He likes the attention. And we see in Will a shadow of Samson. So it's yeah. a way of kind of, because I, I think, uh, having read your series, I think you'd agree with me. History doesn't repeat itself, but it has the same rhythm. You hear the Absolutely. same rhythm through time. And I've always loved stories where something of the past ripples into the future. and. Uh, and we learn the same lesson slightly turned on its ear. And that's what happens to Will. He learns true strength, where true power comes from, and it's not from the amulet. And, um, and I think the uh, using Is it strength, from believing in his dreams? No, it's not from <laughs> believing in his dreams, because his dream was to be on the football team. <laughs> yeah. It's about serving something bigger than himself. And, and I think he ultimately realizes, I don't want to ruin it for everybody, but... Uh, the family that has sustained him all along and his friends and the love they have for each other end up being the thing that's truly powerful and more powerful than any amulet. That's what I think he comes to. But the way he gets there is fun and exciting and dangerous and mysterious and there are lots of subplots and these other characters just started talking to me as I wrote this. And it, it, yeah. you, know, it you know what happens when you get into the, the head of these characters they, they are as real as the people around you. And uh, I live with them every day. You carry them with you every day. And uh, they're the imaginary friends you talk to. That they you are. Can't tell did you have an imaginary about? friend when you were growing up? Not until I started writing novels. Oh, you see, I did have an imaginary <laughs> friend. I won't tell you his name, but I did. I would ring in the old houses in the 70s. They used to have these little uh, phone jacks, and they had a little dot on them, and it looked like a bell. So I'd press the bell, and my imaginary friend would come out. Well, now I carry my whole binder of imaginary friends, and I write about them all the time. So Will Wilder is top of the heap. You, you kind of answered this a little bit, but yeah. just to, to make you jump up and down on it, okay, or to give you the opportunity to. Yeah. Our culture today kind of goes after strength in boys. Yeah. The bo like punishes boys for even wanting to be strong, mm -hmm. for trying to be strong. Mm -hmm. Will Wilder in this story is trying to be strong. He is. Pair that with the other theme that every single movie for kids that yeah. preaches is believe in yourself. Right. Believe in yourself, believe in yourself, believe in right. yourself. Those two things are kind of like the, the two themes discussed in this book. They are. But the end is very different. The yeah. end is very... And, and I would say, uh, you know, again... I, I Don't ruin it for me. I don't want to ruin it. I don't want to give out any spoilers, but I do want to... I, I, I've always loved stories that are true to the character, and I try to be true to these characters as I'm writing. And I really don't preordain how these things are going to end. I know my setup. I know generally who the opposition is, the, who the demon he's going to confront. But then things start to unravel. The end of the books, I don't plot out. I plot out everything else. Yeah. So um, that's as it should be. It's because you want the dominoes to fall. Right. So you you set up all the dominoes, and then you and you don't want to make the audience think you're forcing yeah, something. Yeah. Act and three so, has to be a natural extension. Yeah. So here, yeah. I, I, and, I, and look, it takes you a little time to work out Act three because you know you're, you're, you you want the character to go one way and he wants yeah. to go there. So it ends up being a, a, a piece about strength and power and there's nothing wrong with it. But it comes, it's about what it's serving. Are you serving yourself or are you serving the people around you and something larger than yourself? Right. That's what Will's ultimately confronted with. It's not about the power. Right. The power is to serve an end. That's what he yeah. learns. And ultimately, that's what Samson learned Absolutely. in the original story. Absolutely. So um, there are shades of that. And I, I like weaving in historical uh, uh, reality, historical places and objects. I think it opens kids' minds up to yeah. our culture, our Western heritage. Uh, in this case, we've got the helmet of Joan of Arc. You've got the locks of Samson. Now, I don't think anybody claims to have the locks of Samson, <laughs> but maybe it's at my house. They're somewhere. Uh, I'm sure they're somewhere. Somebody clipped them and took them. Um, and, and there are many other uh, uh, belts, from uh, a cincher from a saint, uh, the, the relics of the wise men. 
all these things creep in. You can actually find most of those relics and objects in museums or churches or libraries around the world. And I love that idea that you're taking something real and taking something imaginary and you blow it up and make people look at it in a new way. Because then these things don't become our, uh, cold relics of the past, but things that drive us into the future with lessons that we can learn and have to learn from them. In, uh, in book three, you've definitely landed more in the superhero genre. Yeah. Where the first two books, the relics feel, you know, the, the Staff of Moses. Yeah. They're a little more external. Right. It's a thing, it's the Tesseract, right? Right. It's, a, it's the thing you found yeah. that's outside of you that has power. But in this right. case, Will experiences yeah. the Samson. Transformation. The transformation into a Samson-like character. Yeah. Samson was the origin inspirationally of most of the superheroes that we he have was. now. Most Indeed. people don't know that, but yeah. the Book of Judges and Samson gave those young Jewish boys in Brooklyn the inspiration <laughs> to come hope. up with these things. Yeah, <laughs> That's right. To, to come up with these first comic book heroes. How aware of, of that were you? How conscious were you of the superhero themes? I didn't, I didn't feel it until I was halfway through the book. Okay. I, I, I kind of stumbled into it. But I knew exactly what, what yep. you're, you're sharing with people, that Samson was the model for Shazam and Superman and all these, you know, brawny uh, superheroes that came and saved the day with their strength. And so as I wrote this, I was conscious of, well, what does that mean today for our boys, for our girls, for, for us as parents? And I don't want to ruin it, but Will Wilder's father also transforms in this book uh, in, in a different way. Um, some have wrapped me because in the past he was kind of a weak sister, always, you know, <laughs> kind of tamping down, trying to keep Will from doing what he's called to do. But that's just dramatizing, I think, what we do consciously or unconsciously with our kids. We have, we, we've, we've learned the hard way. Uh, about certain professions or certain paths in life, and we try to direct them and keep them to a path and keep them on that. This is the safe way for you, son. This is what you should be doing. In some ways, we're all Dan Wilder, that part of him. Well, now you get to see the, I guess, the, the fully evolved Dan Wilder. Dan Wilder in the raw in this book. Papa Bear. Papa Bear. He, yeah. he returns to, I think, who he was, and his son and his family helped get him there. He, he lives up to his last name. Yeah, he does. They all do. Yeah. You know where Wilder comes from? I didn't know this. I don't. When I was looking for a name for the characters, a Wilder is actually a profession. It is one who kills or traps wild creatures or animals. And I thought, that's that, the perfect name for this family. That works. <laughs> it does. It that works, that works fantastically. So for people who haven't read the series at all, yeah. who are, there's three books now. There are. Tell us the origin story of Perilous Falls and oh, Peniel. Yeah. You know, this, this great grandfather, Jacob Wilder. Yeah. What's, give, give us the yeah. origin for well, this. Whole what thing. I love about the story, you can come to any of these books. They are self contained adventures. Uh, it, it's, I think you get a richer experience if you read them through, yeah. but you really can drop in on any one of them. And I kind of give you the backstory, as you know, writing a series. You want to give people the backstory so they can enter into the tale and feel they, they, they understand everything. Uh, Will Wilder is a 12-year-old boy with a supernatural gift. He, on his 12th birthday, begins to see shadows that quickly take shape. And in short order, he realizes he can see demons. No one else can see them. And indeed, we find out his family has been waiting generations for a firstborn Wilder who could see a seer. Because he, he discovers, and I'm ruining a little bit book one for you, but not really. Um, He's part, uh, his family is part of an underground community that has been battling these dark forces and these demons for centuries. There's flashbacks to his great-grandfather, Jacob Wilder. We find out about his, his adventures during the war and how they reflect into the present. And many times the relics uh, or the artifacts that Will encounters in the present in Perilous Falls, we discover at the top of each book how Jacob Wilder came in contact with that relic or fought off some horror to get it. Um, he has a museum, Jacob Wilder, that he created in the middle of Perilous Falls, Peniel, which is a, um, a, a, it, it's a reliquarium. It's referred to as the museum in town, but it actually contains some of the most precious artifacts of history and of all time. The question is, and I haven't answered this and I won't for several books, why did he feel he had to collect all these relics here? Why are they here? Why are they so precious, and why is this town of Perilous Falls under such scrutiny and attack all the time? Um, 
I will answer it, but I can't. Good. Know. Character of Cammie is, she's such a great character. Cammie Merriweather. And she's such an important character. Yeah. And she's that girl who's not impressed with the guy who's very impressive. Right. So that protagonist who's very impressive to readers has a friend who's really likes him, but is like, eh. Yeah. You know, he's yeah. got all these weaknesses. Yeah. She has a bigger role in this third book. She does. She, Cammie Merriweather, and part of that was conscious because I have so many girl readers, and I wanted them to feel they're right. part of the adventure, too. And they love Will. They go, you know, the thing about Will is, you know, all, the, the girls, the girls, you know, love him, and the boys want to be him. So there's a nice, yep. you know, balance there. It works. But Cammie and Aunt Lucille have really, they sort of come to the fore in this book. Cammie is, is that, you know, kind of headstrong, smart, sees through everything going on, best friend we all had or wish we had. Right. Um, and I, I had friends, I had friends in, in, in grammar school, in high school like this, who were just th th those formative uh, girls who would say, S what are you doing? Slow your roll. S slow your roll, man. <laughs> what a, wait a minute. You don't realize what's happening here? And Cammie is that voice of reason, but I do like in this adventure, she um, jumps in and kind of utilizes one of these relics as well uh, and has her own uh, role in the, in the drama that I didn't plan at all. That just okay. kind of happened as I was writing. So uh, accentuating her character in book three was in part for your readers, but also she just did what she does in the story, which is she kind of grabs she the wheel. She took over. She grabs the wheel and she does a little steering. She took over. Well, Cammie took over. She's a fun character. She's great. Cammie's fun. She's, she's, she's kind of wry. You know, she's, she's way more hard bitten, right? You know, but but not in a bad way. No, she's no. just she, yeah, very perceptive. Yeah, she, she, pushes your bruise. Yeah, she, yeah, I see exactly what you're doing <laughs> with your ego. And she's got her brother at home, right. Who you know he he's a special needs kid. She helps him. She you know she's so she's not uh, she's a helper. Cammy wants to help people, right? And um, and here she also you realize the kind of heroine side of her that she's called to her own battle here. And she's not afraid to mix it up and get her hands dirty and to call Will out when he's in the wrong. There's a theme of seductive entertainment in book three oh, as well. Oh, yes. The, the theme that comes through with the DJ Cassius. Yeah. And this, this seductive music that kind of, the, the seductive music that takes over and sweeps people literally yeah. off their feet. Right. What are you getting at, if anything, mm. there? Are you, are, is there something thematically you'd like to unpack there a little well, bit Well, uh, in this story, you have a, a very charismatic DJ that comes to town with his own groove and mixes, and everybody in town is captivated by him. Um, and his music has a particular effect on people that I won't ruin. But um, there is something, I think, about the loneliness of our age that I believe finds its way through delivery of media. And when I walk in most cities, except my beloved hometown of New Orleans, where we all jam and party <laughs> together and dance to the same beat, you go to most places and everybody's got their buds in their ears. They're on their own little screen in their own little world. And they might be laughing and engaged, but it's just them and the screen or them and their own little groove. And that's kind of what happens in Perilous Falls in this book. You see the, the individual, the crushing loneliness of technology and the effect it has on people. And I've dramatized that and made it move for my storyline to work. But uh, there is something in there. There's a little bit of a social observation, I guess. As far as this construction goes, you say there's more, there's more books coming. Yeah. How far apart were these books? So the first one mean? released when? First one released in 2016. 16, 16, I think. So you've kept and, a pretty good pace. Yeah, but I, I, there was a two-year lap in between, a two-year lag between book two and book three, and that right. was because I was covering the Trump administration. Right. And I had Perilous Falls at every moment around yes. me. Yes. You were Washington. living in Perilous Falls. I was living in Perilous Falls. So you expect us to see more installments over the next couple of years? They're coming in the next few years. Okay. Yeah. It'll take time. Great job. Congratulations. Nate, thank you so much. Let's get this out. Wheel Wilder 3. Amulet of Power. Everywhere. February 19th. February 19th. Everywhere February 19th. Thank you, Nate. It's Read it. An honor. I'm going to finish it tonight. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Great thank being you. with you. Will Wilder 3, The Amulet of Power, releases February 19th. Oh, what an adventure awaits you. You can still pre-order the book at EWTN's Religious Catalog, Amazon. I have all of the outlets aggregated at willwilderbooks.com. 
Now, for those of you in California, I will be at the Reagan Library for a major signing event and talk on Friday, February 22nd. I hope you'll come out. All the details will be at RaymondArroyo.com. Also, the day before that, I'll be in Bryant, Texas on Thursday at a gala for 40 Days for Life. I hope you'll come out. I'm signing at both events. We'll have a grand time. I'll be announcing upcoming events in the days ahead. My next guest was nominated for an Oscar for his role as Lieutenant Dan in the 1994 blockbuster Forrest Gump. He's an Emmy winner, a family man, musician and philanthropist, working on behalf of our nation's fighting men and women. He's also the author of a brand new memoir, Grateful American, a journey from self to service. Please welcome back to the program. Gary Sinise. Welcome Thanks. back, Gary. Good Great to, to see you, as always. Thank you. And, and to see you on our, on, on our turf here. Why do you subtitle the book A Journey from Self to Service? Well, uh, I didn't know what the book was going to be called when I, when, when I started to write it. But as I started to pour through it, uh, you know, uh, these recurring themes started to come out. Gratitude, appreciation. And I realized that this memoir kind of tracked... Uh, my life through the time where I was focused on this singular sort of acting thing mm -hmm. that I was doing and building a theater company and, you know, the things that were around my small world and that it evolved into this broader mission story mm. of, of service to others, which I'm, I'm very much involved in now mm -hmm. uh, because of my foundation, the Gary Sinise Foundation and everything. So it really is. That's, that's exactly what the book is. Mm -hmm. I am a grateful American, and it is a journey following uh, this, this road from yeah. kind of a self-focus to a broader service focus. You open the book, uh, and you title the, the prologue, Stunned, and it's, it's about a, a seminal event that happened about 25 years ago that confirmed you in what's become your life's mission, your work. Tell me about that moment. Yeah, I wanted to start the book with something and, and then kind of go travel mm -hmm. back. So I started yeah. with a kind of a pivotal moment, uh, an important moment uh, that sort of really stunned me yeah. <laughs> in a way when I walked in to the Disabled American Veterans National Convention 25 years ago this mm -hmm. summer. And uh, they had seen Forrest Gump. It had just come out about a month before, and they'd mm -hmm. seen Lieutenant Dan. And this is an organization that advocates for, they m might have two million members that are all wounded veterans. Oh. And uh, they invited me to their national convention. I walked in, and I was so emotional to receive their acknowledgement. They wanted mm -hmm. to acknowledge me for playing a disabled veteran in what they consider to be a positive way. And you know, 2,000 wounded veterans cheering you on, that, that was very emotional. It, yeah. I never forgot it. You, you, you talk in the book also about your grandfather's service. You take us way back uh, in the book. And you had family who were veterans, your wife's family as well. Um, tell me a sense of how that laid the groundwork for this concern and heart you have for military men and women and their families. Well, it's funny, when I was a kid, um, my, you know, and my dad was in the Navy in, in uh, the early 50s, and I was, I was born in 55. He got out of the Navy in 55. I was born, uh, I was conceived here at Anacostia oh. uh, on the naval base there, and that's where my dad was stationed. He was working in the film lab uh, as a naval, a photo mate is what mm. they called him. And that's where he learned the film business. He moved, uh, uh, my mom went back, she left, she was pregnant, she went back to Chicago, said, I'm going to have the baby there. Uh, he got out of the Navy about a week after I was born. Um, and then he went into the film business in Chicago, started working in the film business. His dad had served in World War I, and his two older brothers served in World War II. So I've got this family on my side of the family of veterans, mm. but I never really talked to them too much about their yeah. service when I was a young kid. It was really when I met my wife... And she introduced me to her brothers who had served in Vietnam, Vietnam in the yeah. U.S. Army. Her sister was in the Army. Her sister married a Vietnam veteran who was in the Army for 22 years, combat medic in Vietnam. They were the ones that uh, sort of, you know, started to talk to me about military service and what it was like to be a Viet Vietnam veteran, mm -hmm. serve in the jungles, and then come home mm -hmm. to a nation that uh, really didn't treat them very well. And they had to kind of recline into the shadows a bit. 
Um, I felt very badly for our Vietnam veterans, and so in the early 80s, I just started to do some things in Chicago to support them in different ways. And that sort of planted the seeds a little bit for what would happen in the 90s when I had the opportunity to, to audition for Forrest Gump and then play a Vietnam veteran. I very much wanted to do that because of the military veterans in my own family. Mm. And that led me to start working with our wounded and and it's all, yeah. it all turned. There was a turning point. There's a chapter in the book called Turning Point, right. which is the September 11th attack. Mm -hmm. That was a real turning point for me, and I, I started moving into, into the service work that I haven't stopped. Hmm. No, it really, it arrested. People who were not there at the time don't remember what that moment did to the entire country. I mean, it was a shock to the whole system of the country. No but question. to those who were... Uh, dealing who had first responders in their family or were in any way involved with the, the, the victims of, of 9-11 or uh, the New York scene, it became very real. The, the threat, the danger, and how fragile the freedom we took for granted was. I, I write about that in the book, the, the fear that I had after that, that event. I mean, that was terrifying, yeah. you know, to watch those buildings come down, watch people fall from those buildings, watch you know, what was happening in the Pentagon and, and Shanksville and all the, and, and then remember uh, shortly after that, all of a sudden anthrax is floating right. through the mail and everything. I mean, the, the, it was crazy. It was a yeah. very paranoid time. Everybody was on yeah. edge yeah. and I was on edge and my heart was broken. I just, I just wanted to do something. And I remember, I think I told you this one time. Yeah. Uh, Friday after the Tuesday of September 11th was a national day of prayer. Hmm. George Bush said, everybody, <clears throat> we need to do something together as a country. I want uh, Friday to be a national day of prayer. The churches were packed across the country. I went to our little church, little Catholic church, and there was no room to sit. I mean, I was standing against the wall with my family. Every space was filled. And I remember coming out of that feeling that, <clears throat> you know, I mean, it was, it was comforting, but I, I needed to do something beyond that. And I heard this calling, this thing, this message that came to me about service mm. and the healing power of service work. Mm. And uh, that made a lot of sense to me. So I started raising my hand, you know, for the USO mm. and, you know, what can I do for your military mm. charity? Can I come and raise money for you? Can I draw mm. some attention to you? Uh, do some PSAs, whatever it is. Uh, play concerts for the troops, yeah. and, and it just started to go like this. And there's a period in, in that service history where you look at it, and it's like I was gone every weekend doing wow. something. And I was shooting a television show at the same I, time. Yeah. So it was a crazy period, but I really, I was getting so much out of making an impact by letting people know that I cared about them and I appreciated them. And, mm. And the war got worse, remember. There, right. there was a time where Walter Reed was just filled to the Packed. gills with wounded, yeah. and they didn't know where to put them. There were so many. Hmm. And uh, during that period of time, I was going to the hospitals all the time, meeting a lot of the families of our wounded, meeting our wounded service members, trying to come up with some ideas uh, in, in ways to help them. Yeah. And, and so I started raising money. I started uh, getting into home building, where we would build specially adapted homes for Those our wounded. Incredible. And it all ma manifested itself into the creation of the Gary Sinise Foundation, which is toward the end of the book. Yeah. You see the service journey into this full-time nonprofit that is devoted to serve and honor the needs of our military men and women and, and first responders. Yeah, and yeah. we're getting great things done at the mm. Gary Sinise Foundation. No, I, I've seen it up close. Now, I want to talk about it in a moment. I want to. You go. <clears throat> you get into your career as well, and I, I want to back up a little bit. Uh, in high school, and this I didn't know. In high school, you were not exactly the straight arrow that people think you are today, Gary Sinise. <laughs> I mean, you were, you were doing pot, you were selling it, uh, a little scrape with the law after you signed on to be in, in West Side Story. What happened there? Where did this acting bug come from during that period? Well, I had a, I had a lot of trouble as a kid. I, I never learned um, properly, I don't think, how to read and write. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I've, I've gotten better over the years, yes, obviously. You have, I, I yes, wrote you, a book. You've written a book now. My so. high school teacher is amazed. You know, this kid wrote a book. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, you could put words together. You see that? They make sense. And, and when she first met me, I, uh, you know, I was just bumbling around. And, and um, 
You know, I was having trouble. We, my, I tell this story in the book where, where we moved from town to town a little yeah. bit. Right in those, in those years where you're, you know, you're developing a lot of friends and mm -hmm. you're making friends. And then all of a sudden we uprooted and moved and I had, to, I had to, you know, I was, had to make new friends. And that was, that was a struggle. Mm -hmm. I played in rock bands. I got into trouble with a lot of things that I write about a little bit in the book because, it, it, you know, I do hope that, uh, you know, somebody who might be going through a similar thing can see that there is light at the end of the tunnel and if you, you can turn yourself around. And I was lucky. I was, you know, in, in some ways, I don't know, I happened to be standing in a hallway and this drama teacher walked down the hall uh, when I was a sophomore in high school and she told me to come and audition for West Side Story because I looked like a gang member and she thought I'd be good in the show. And so I did. I oh. went and auditioned and I got in the show. Mm. And all of a sudden I discovered here's this aimless kid who's really, really troubled, having a lot of trouble adjusting. And all of a sudden I found this community of kids that I loved and I just loved doing the play and I wanted, that's all I wanted to do. So. Yeah. I, uh, I just auditioned for every play I could after that, oh. and it, you know, as soon as I got out of high school, I started a theater. I wanted to keep doing it. Well, not any theater. You start the Steppenwolf Theater Company, which is now this iconic uh, institution <coughs> in, in Chicago. But we it's, were kids. Yeah, in the beginning, it's you mm -hmm. and Laurie Metcalf and John Malkovich, um, yeah. your pals, and you're doing these shows <coughs> together. What was it like in those early years? I mean, you all were all learning at the same time, I imagine. Yeah, my, uh, in West Side Story. And your wife, Moira, who was also she a She was an early yeah. member, yeah, yeah, 1976. In West Side Story, uh, the guy was playing Tony, the lead. You know, I was one of the chorus guys. Yeah. I, was, I was a shark, you know. Pepe. <clears throat> yeah, Pepe the shark. <laughs> and the guy who was playing the lead was Jeff Perry. Oh. And Jeff and I became best best friends. And uh, he was very different than me. He was a guy who carried a, a million books around, and he had glasses, and <laughs> read Chekhov, and Stanislavski, and stuff. I didn't know what any of that was. And I was just a rock and roll kid, you know. Uh -huh. But we really connected, and we hit it off. And after high school, uh, I just wanted to keep doing plays, so I started this comp little company with some of the high school kids. And Jeff had gone off to college to Illinois State University, and I told him about this. And so for his summer break, he came up to do a play with this little community com mm -hmm. company, uh, a play called by Tom Stoppard called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Are Dead. And he had made very good friends with another guy at, at uh, ISU named Terry Kenny, who was another great actor. So he said, I'll bring Terry with me, and he'll be in it too. And so, <laughs> So Terry came up, and the three of us really bonded during that, that uh, experience. And we said, you know, when you guys get out of college, we're going to pick this up again and do something. Mm. So a couple years later, they get out of college, and we find a space in the basement of a closed-down Catholic school. They, the, I, I went to the priest, and I said, can, you know, I'm a little kid. <laughs> can we have your basement and put on some plays? And he said, sure. And, you know, it was closed down. They weren't doing anything with us. He, he he said he'd give it to us for a dollar a year, for oh. just a write-off. And so we built an 88-seat theater in this basement of a Catholic school in Highland Park, Illinois. And we recruited uh, six more people, and Lori Metcalf, Moira Harris, John Malkovich, Alan Wilder, H.E. Bacchus, and Nancy Evans. And we became the original nine members of Steppenwolf. And from there, it just... It just kept growing and growing and growing. Then we moved into the city of Chicago mm -hmm. and built our own building. And now we're about to break ground on another building. And you know, it's 45 years old now. That that theater. Unbelievable. Did you ever expect Lieutenant Dan to do what it's done? And why has it resonated in the way it has all these years later? I mean, generations mm -hmm. now. We're talking about multiple generations now that see you as Lieutenant Dan. And that gives you a certain credibility in addition to your work in the, in the veteran community. You know, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, can you... It, it's, it, you can think of a few movies that are constantly... You see them every right. year. They're always on television. It's, you know, it's a wonderful life yeah. it's on every year. Right. And new Wizard generations yeah. want, want very, it. There's very a few, few of them. Forrest Gump seems like it's on television all the time. Somebody is always texting me, hey, I'm watching Gump on TV right now. <laughs> and it seems like it's never quite left the consciousness mm -hmm. in some way. 
Uh, so new generations of kids are seeing Forrest Gump. I'll go and play for these concerts and uh, these concerts on military bases. There'll be 5,000 people out there. Mm. They're all screaming Lieutenant Dan at me, and I, I'll ask them, you know, how many people here have seen Forrest Gump? And everybody cheers, and then I'll, wow. then I'll say, is there anybody uh, over, you know, over 10 who hasn't seen that movie? And, and you know, it's very quiet. Nobody wow. Said it. People, I don't know if they're just embarrassed or what, but they, <laughs> it seems like everybody's seen the film. And so it's. It's always there. When I started going out for the troops, I hadn't I hadn't had CSI New York yet, mm -hmm. so I wasn't on television every week. And uh, mm -hmm. I had done I had done some movies, but I was still kind of that the guy, you know, mm -hmm. the guy who played this guy and the guy yeah. who played that guy. People didn't know my name, but they knew Lieutenant, Lieutenant Dan, Dan, and they recognized me from that. And that's mm -hmm. why I named my band after the character. Yeah. Uh, I figured, well, if they don't know my name, they'll know Lieutenant Dan. They'll know Dan. Lieutenant Dan or they'll figure it out, and they have. Right. Tell me, when I covered the Snowball Express this past Christmas, it blew me away. I have to tell you, it's not at all what I expected to see. I thought we'd have a bunch of kids having a good time at Disney World. But it really is, it's a therapeutic moment. You, you tried to explain <laughs> it, but, but you have to experience <clears throat> it and see yeah. it. And um, what, what goes through your mind when you see these people discovering each other in their shared pain and in the pain that they alone understand, these families of veterans who've lost their lives. Um, and, and what do you say to them? Well, it's humbling, you know. It, it, I mean, it, it, in, it, and it's moving, and <clears throat> I just embrace them and let them know that I love them and that I care about them and that they're not alone. That's, that's the thing about this particular event. When yeah. we bring all the kids together mm -hmm. and the families, these are kids that, that live all over the country in little right. towns or wherever it is. They, mi they might be the only military family in that town, and they lost their mom or their dad in military mm -hmm. service, and that child is going through something that not, none of the other kids are going through. Right. But when they come together with this event that we do every year for these children and they meet all these uh, over a thousand other kids that have all gone through this grieving of losing, you know, a mom or a dad in military service, mm -hmm. they, they really feel like they're in a community, like they're in a family, like mm -hmm. they're not alone. And they make lasting friendships. I mean, these kids give each other their numbers and then they go off to the little yeah. towns and they stay in touch with they each do. other. And they meet and up the following year. Oh, it's a network of, of friends that are made. And every year, unfortunately, there are new kids. Mm. You know, there are new families that lose somebody mm. and we bring them in. Uh, there are some kids that uh, have been coming for a while and when they get to be 18, they sort of graduate. Yeah. And we make room for other kids. Because every year there's over a thousand kids that we do this with. This. Yeah. This year that you came was the first year that we've taken them to Disney World. Yeah. And it was the first year that it, the, the entire thing is part of the Gary Sinise Foundation. Mm. Uh, I've been doing it since 2007. It was its own organization for right. a while. And then when we made the deal with D Disney, you we were going to have to raise in. some additional money. Mm -hmm. And we thought the best way to do that was to bring it under our umbrella. Mm. And we were able to raise the money. So that's just one of our initiatives at the Gary yeah. Sinise Foundation. Just putting our hands on our Gold Star families and making sure that they know they're not alone. Yeah. It's, it's tough, you know, it's tough for them and we want them to, to heal. I'm gonna show people this little clip of video um, that your foundation released this week. It went viral and it is people thanking you, being grateful for your work. Watch this. Thanks, Lieutenant Dan. I just want to thank you for everything that you do. When your foundation helped me and my family recover from the devastating Tubbs fire, not only me and my family, but also hundreds of other firefighters. Give me a reaction to that when you saw all those people thanking you. Well, first it was a shock because I was surprised surprised by it. My team mm. kind of pulled yeah. a fast one on me and, and uh, they, they were sneaking around behind my back <laughs> like getting everybody to send in videos yeah. and they were putting it all together and they, they, they had it perfectly planned for, to, to show it to me on the day that my book launched. Mm. And so we're on, on this book tour and you know, we're in the hotel room, we're about to leave to go do some more interviews and they, 
you know, I'm like in a hurry yeah. and everything. They made me <laughs> oh, sit down. We and needed watch to watch it. this. Yeah, I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? So they made me watch it, and the first first one up is Jay Leno, and he starts talking to Gary. Hey, Gary. You know, <laughs> I'm like, what's this? <laughs> and then then Ron Howard comes on, and then another, and it keeps going on and there are first responders there and there are military folks from around the country and overseas and, and there are gold star children and, and some of our wounded uh, yeah. that we've done houses for yeah and it's i i'm thinking about it and i i get choked up just yeah. just think about it because it, it it was very very touching and very moving and Overwhelming. I mean, yeah, no, it was a beautiful. Just to experience. see that people did that for me. I mean, yeah. I'm a grateful American. There's yeah, well, no and, and people are grateful <clears throat> for you. I mean, the response I saw on social media was unbelievable. I got to ask you this before I let you go, because you talk about it in the book. It seems as if, and you told me moments ago, this is really a calling from God for you, and that's how you see it. This work you're doing. I, I, I feel called to service for sure. Um, and, and there was there were these key moments along mm -hmm. the way, you know. And I can, I, you know, I talk about that a little in, in the book, that that moment where our priest uh, on, on the Friday after September 11th attacks, everybody is just in so much pain. You know, yeah. people are just crying through every day. Yep. You know, it, recalling the images that we all saw on television mm -hmm. and the things that are happening. Everybody was fearful and I remember the priest getting up and the first thing he said was this this was a tough week. Mm. And he was right on the money. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody it was a tough week for everybody. Yeah. It was a tough week for me and and and, and it continued to be tough. Mm -hmm. And I continued to be in pain. And uh, something I got out of that homily that day was that uh, service is a great healer. Mm. Serving others is a great healer and we should all pull together to do something positive for somebody else to help them through this terrible time. Mm. And having veterans in my family and having been involved with the DAV and the disabled veterans and everything, uh, and and remembering what it was like for our Vietnam veterans to go off to war and then come back and not have services provided for them, not have the country embrace them and right. welcome them home. They got it, they didn't even get a welcome home. And then seeing our deploying troops go to Afghanistan and Iraq and watching our nation start to divide itself yeah. in whether they supported the war or not, I felt terrible for Mm. our deploying service members and I yep. knew that was where my calling was going to be. Mm. I was going to be called to do this service yep. work to help them through this difficult time of deploying mm. to the war zone in reaction to September 11th. And once I started, mm. the healing began mm. and I could see the impact I was making and I just, I wanted to embrace every every family member, every person that was deploying, every first responder that I could. What's on the horizon for the foundation now? What's the next thing? The foundation is growing. Uh, we're, we're expanding our impact and our reach. Uh, I brought in some new team members that are helping uh, uh, lead the way. I mean, I'm, you know, I put my acting career on hold. Um, mm. The last thing I did was in December of 2016. So mm. it's over two years oh. that I've just poured myself into this work. Mm -hmm. And I think probably three, I've only worked three and a half out of lo, uh, the last eight years. And the, the, the rest of the time has been focused on this mission of building this foundation mm -hmm. in hopes that we could create a lasting, reliable resource for the American people who want to support our defenders. If you go to GarySiniseFoundation.org, mm -hmm. you can learn a ton of things about the great programs we're mm -hmm. We're, uh, we have at the foundation and the people that we're impacting. And you can learn from me as to why it's important to take care of our defenders. Yeah, well, thank you for coming on. Thank you for the book, Grateful American. You're a great American. Uh, from Self to Service, the new memoir by Gary Sinise. It's available everywhere at bookstores. And the Gary Sinise Foundation, of course, is at GarySiniseFoundation.org. Gary, thanks thank for being you. here. Again. Thank you very much. That is all the time we have for now. Until next week. 
The show continues on Facebook and Twitter. You can like me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to join us next week. Andy Wilson's entire interview with me about the new Will Wilder book, The Amulet of Power. We'll bring that to you and much more. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.